This is the Sports Sit Down with Mike Demurgis. Mike Demurgis, along with Lance Eastley for the Sports Sit Down. And Lance, 10 years ago, you became a household name for better or worse. Take us back 10 years in that famous game between Green Bay and the Seattle Seahawks and what's called the failed Mary today. Uh, you were thrust into football immortality for, like I said, for better or for worse. Yeah, I was. Um, I never thought I would end up in the NFL doing anything uh, due to my age and background. I, I coached for eight years at the college level, JUCO in California. And my work schedule, I changed to banking and it wouldn't allow me to do what I was doing. So I started doing college football. I was a high school, top high school official. I could do that on Friday nights. And they, uh, they, they, the NFL knows who everybody is. They watch everybody. So they sent me an application. And I thought, ah, this is never going to happen. It's not going to go anywhere. But I sent it in. Then they said, we want you to come try out. So I went and tried out. And then they kept bringing me back and along with some other people to fill the spots. And now so this, we went through training. All, this is because there was a, 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 a referee strike at the time, correct? Actually, it was a lockout. The NFL locked them out. It wasn't a strike. So, and so I, I've heard references to we were scabs. That's, that's an incorrect term because my uncle was in the union. And uh, it, the correct term is uh, for scabs is people who... Uh, our NFL officials, if they went across the line, now they're a scab. That's so we weren't scabs. We were just hired in to do a job. And um, I never thought we would see the field. Never in a million years. And then here I am on Monday Night Football with the Raiders and uh, who they play the Cowboys. And I was just it was overwhelming um, as far as just being there. So, so, so take us back first before we get to the, the nitty gritty of everything. Um, wh- where were you when you got the call and they said Re- report to your first NFL game? Did you do any preseason games? Uh, up that there? was the first preseason okay. game, the Cowboys and, and the uh, Raiders, you know, that's, that was it. Monday yeah. night football, right yeah. after the Olympics. So, so what was your initial reaction when you got the call? Did you turn to your wife and you know, say, I'm going to be a, net, a referee in the NFL? Yeah, and called some of my friends, uh, my dear friends, and told them the news and um, told them that I was going to be on Monday Night Football. Everybody tuned in and watched me and the camera. Well, I was all over um, the camera. Uh, you know, they showed me next to the, the uh, Cowboys players and coach. Um, it, was, it was crazy. And then in certain – papers newspapers there was one in Oakland I was on the cover talking to Carson Palmer and and who else did they have been another USC uh, uh, Heisman winner Matt, they, Matt, Matt Leinart yeah I think he was there I talked to Janikowski you know I got to talk to these players on the sidelines that they weren't playing in the preseason games but uh, what, what really amazed me is the first punt I was a deep official and I got back there and I thought, this guy is too far back. There's no way they're going to kick it this far. Next thing I know, it was a missile launch. That ball went so high and so far. I thought, wow, these guys can really kick the ball. Talk, talk about the, the, a lot of players when they go from high school to college and certainly college to the pros, they talk about the fastness of the game, the quickness of the game. What was it like for a referee to see the, the change of pace in the game going from college to the pros? Well, for me in my position as a back judge or side judge, field judge, the skilled, the, the receivers, which is who we pretty much cover, they run about the same speed as they do in college. They don't start go from a four, 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 three to a, a three, nine or three, you know, they, that doesn't happen. So they're, they're fast, but we're used to it at college. The main difference is the linemen, the defense of, you know, the big guys, how fast they are, because they turn it up. So they're, that's why it's not a good idea to run as a quarterback. You know, you, you're going to, yeah, I, I saw it up and close. I saw RG3 try to outrun them. Oh, no, that wasn't happening. 
you know and so, so at, what, at what point did you you feel like you had your 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 feet on the ground that you, you didn't feel nervous you didn't feel that you were overwhelmed at, at what point uh, if at all did you think you know th- every, everything's gonna be okay i can do this i belong well <laughs> Just to tell you, I got injured. I pulled a hammy before the, my first game, and I was getting treatment, and I was really scared. I had it all taped up with that black tape, and I thought that I thought it may go out on me during the game. Let's just put it that way. And the second or third play came down. It was a pass passing play, and I had to turn and run, and it worked. Um, as far as nerves. Um, my officiating and I may, people may not understand this, but I did basketball, football, um, and, and that's about it. But I'm, I was a big time golfer at one point and I learned you can't get emotional and upset. You just can't allow that stuff to happen. So I have a real calm demeanor and I'm, I'm pretty, I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm looking. There's no reason to get upset. I have to focus on my job. So all that stuff, I just put aside. I really don't. And even dealing with the coaches, you'll see, you see pictures on the internet of coaches yelling at me like Jim Harbaugh. And even that doesn't rattle. Me. <laughs> Jim Harbaugh yell at a coach. Come. I know. Come I mean, on, referee. That, yeah. That doesn't surprise. happen. Surprise, surprise. What, 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 what was the biggest challenge you felt uh, for you at that time? Well, the traveling was a challenge. Um, I'm trying to think. Hmm. Just making sure we we worked a good game. The challenge was that we were the replacement officials, as they call them. Every week we were so scrutinized and we didn't want to be the crew that everybody said, this is why, you know, they can't be out there. Um, unfortunately, because I had that call, it shook the whole world. And the next week, the regular officials were back. So basically take us to that game 10 years ago, uh, green Bay is playing Seattle Seahawks last play of the game. Russell Wilson heaves it golden Tate pushes off one defender jumps up for the ball with MD Jennings. It looks like Jennings comes down with it. And then all mayhem, all hell breaks out for lack of a better word, better word. Yeah. Just describe what happened there as you recall. Well, as the ball was coming, I had the goal line. There was a tight end for the Seahawks coming across it. So I had to watch the arc of the ball to see if he was going to get it. If, you know, I had to, I had to protect the goal line. By the time I turned the whole push from Golden Tate to Shields, um, I didn't see it. You know, I, I really, I was and you, too and you late. can't make a call. You didn't see. So, yeah, I, I really, and the other thing is the philosophy and the coaches know this, the players know this on a, on, on a play like that. It's like every man for himself. And there's, they box people. They should box people out like they do in basketball. So like they're going to get a rebound. The ball's coming to the rim. And typically you, you can see some of that. If you look at enough hail Marys, but hail Marys, well, except this week are kind of really rare, but we saw them in college and in the pros, a lot of them and some successful and, and most of them not. But uh, so so what I saw from that point, my point of view, is Golden Tate had the ball with both hands, and he came down inbounds, and I saw there were another set of hands on the ball, but he was the first one to the ground. Then the from looking at film, the Packer player, he came down and had enough of the ball for them both to go down. Um, and at that point, I was praying that when I got to that pile, one guy clearly had it. Well, that did not happen. Both players had the ball. Like I always say, it's, it was like a meatball with a bunch of spaghetti around it. So, so you, you rule touchdown, the, the other referee rules interception. What was no, it no. Here's what happened. Cause he, 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 he waved his hands. So, so it, which means stop clock. We're going to talk about this. Okay. Um, so, so I went, um, I looked down, he looked down. We looked each other in the eyes and 
I saw his, we didn't, the problem is we didn't communicate like, what do you have? That's something we should have said. Okay. And I'll take ownership over that. But anyway, I looked at him and his arms started going up and I just assumed that he had touchdown just like me. And then I saw him waving his arms after they went up and I thought, oh no, this is optics do not look good. This, this, you know, everybody's going to have a fit over this. So, you know, that was it. Then it went to replay. Oh, well, we had to pot, get in the pile and separate the players. Yeah, I, I, had, I, I watched the video and you're, you're fight. You're trying to, to make the right call. You're fighting linemen and uh, receivers and, and everybody to get in there to, to, to make that call. And it real, got real physical for you to try and see who had the ball. And by then Tate had yeah. the ball, correct? Yeah, him and MD Jennings, they both had it. So I'm pulling them apart because once you, you rule, you want to get them out of there. There were five Packers and two Seahawks, the old Tate and the tight end. And so I'm pulling them. In the NFL, you may have seen, I don't know, if the Bucks game and the uh, Saints and the mayhem they had and, and officials going to the ground. And, and in high school, we let them – we were not supposed to touch them, but in college, uh, same kind of thought. You don't get in there. You let them do it. You throw flags and uh, you try to separate them. You're not, they may have changed that in college. I'm not sure, but in the NFL, they tell you flat out fights break out. You got to go in there and separate people. And, and I was in a game at St. Louis, the Rams in uh, Washington that I, I I got into piles like that. It was the craziest game I've ever been a part of. I had blood all over my jersey. It wasn't mine. Um, but anyway. Uh, so so you go to the bottom of the pile. Jennings and, and Tate still have their portion of the ball. It looked like, looked like Tate had a little more of it uh, at, the, at that time. What was – and at this point now, the announcers uh, have – I've looked at this over and over and over and it, the optics are bad. It, it looks like it's the wrong call here. What was yeah. the conversation going on between the, your fellow referees and, and yourself? And well, at that time, and, and why couldn't it have been overturned an in instant replay? That's, that's where the, if you, we, somebody had a problem with that, it goes to replay. I knew that it's going to replay. Everybody knows it. I had, uh, scoring play earlier in that game that I incorrectly ruled the, I, my position. I didn't see he was diving and his leg slid out and I had him in, but they went back and replay and saw that his leg had kind of touched the white. So everything goes to replay um, on a scoring play like that. And I, so I'm out of it. Whatever they decide, they can decide I was wrong. They could decide I was right. It'll be they fixed. Came That's back. All. Oh, everything will be nice, nice. No one's going to know who Lance Lee's Easley is. He's going to go have dinner, go home, and, and, and sure. we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. I, I wouldn't know you right now. No, no, you wouldn't. And, boy, once that game was over, getting on the bus back to the to our hotel, did, my did you, phone. Did, did, you feel was, a pit? did you feel a pit in your stomach as you're leaving the field? And did you? Oh, kind of, kind yeah. Of, like the whispers, the other referees are saying, boy, we really screwed this one up. No, 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 no. We didn't say that as a crew. We, we didn't get into that. Um, there were some other things that happened that a referee sent the team off the field, which they had to still kick the extra point. And he sent Green Bay off, which added more time. And our, our supervisor was really upset about that with us too. Um, he said, did you guys talk about it? That's about it. And we said, no. And, uh, he was done with us, but we got back to the hotel and everybody's phones are just blowing up. Um, and it, it just, we all had a pit in our son in our room that afterwards you go to with our supervisor, you could have heard a pin drop. You could have heard a pin drop on that bus. Um, it was crazy. But one funny thing is when I had to go over there to make that call, and I made that call. The first thought I had is I have a lot of dear friends that are Green Bay Packer fans. And the first thought I had is they're going to hate me the rest of my life. I mean, just weird, <laughs> weird that I, that was my first thought. Yeah, I, I just watched the video before we did this interview again. I haven't seen it in a while. And Aaron Rodgers is walking off the field. And he's like, 
tells the camera, get, get out of my way here. I, it's, we, we shouldn't have lost this game. So, so you, you get the call from your friends. At, at what point do you realize my life is going to change and my anonymous life is, is, is gone forever? You know, to be honest, I just thought it would blow over. It wouldn't be a big deal. Um, but the next morning I saw all over, the, I had to fly out of there and I saw all over the Seattle papers. I was on the, the headlines and on ESPN inside the, the airports. I was all over that. So I kind of had a hat and, and kind of pulled it down to try to be anonymous because my face was everywhere. Um, and, and so that was, I flew back to like Fresno. I think it was, I had to do, I, we had a regional meeting and uh, with my bank. And so I had to go there from Seattle and I went to the meetings. Then we went out to dinner. Then we, we, or uh, we met and then we went out to dinner afterwards and uh, with some of my coworkers. And then we'd see at ESPN, it's like everywhere. And there I was, all they could talk about is that. So, you know, I knew, Things were starting to go a uh, certain direction. Then my wife called and said, people are all over our lawn. This is crazy. I had to call NFL security, get rid of the people. Um, so that's it. It got started getting insane until Wednesday morning. I woke up and went to the meeting and my boss pulled me aside and he said, uh, well, first the CEO of our company Email, emailed me or texted me and said, hey, you'll be okay, you'll, you'll bounce. And I'm thinking like, be okay, what's he talking about? And my, my boss said, do you know Twitter? Do you deal with that? I said, yeah. I said, I, I know Twitter. Um, I have an account, don't really use it. He says, well, you're more popular than Kim Kardashian right now. Wow, you're, you're bigger than Kim Kardashian's butt? That's amazing. <laughs> No, no, more pun. No, pun, no pun on words there. <laughs> yeah, but I can. I saw the Twitter ranky. There's a somewhere you can go and it shows it. Uh, but yeah, I was blowing up on Twitter and people were starting to make fake accounts, fake Twitter accounts, fake Instagram, fun, fake, fake Facebook, you know, using my name, saying they, I mean, it just the internet was out of control. And then my boss just told me, just go back to the, your hotel room and relax. So I went back there, I turn on TV, I was literally on every channel where I lived, you know, which was unbelievable. So I just, and both my cell phones were just ringing off the hook. One, my business one, I was getting death threats, bomb threat, you know, well, just death threats. Gamblers mostly, not Packer fans. And then on my personal, it was all my friends and family just ring, and the media, just ringing, ringing, ringing. I just put them down and went to sleep for a while hoping it would all go away, got on my knees, talked to God saying, hey, man, can you intervene here? Um, because this is way getting out of control. So um, then the media started calling, like Matt Lauer called me at four in the morning. He's trying to get me on the show. And I was thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I really want to do that. But then I came to a conclusion. I couldn't talk to all my friends and family that uh, were there, you know, talk, talk to me. It was impossible. Um, too many were trying to reach out. So I thought, well, if I go on the show, I can tell everybody I'm all right. Um, so, and then I got a hold of JB from the NFL today. He, he contacted me, his crew. So I, I agreed to go on their show as well. Um, so to, to go ahead and explain what happened and, and get my face out there to let everybody know I was okay. It's it's easy to criticize when you don't know somebody and the referees and your group was all new yeah. and uh, so it makes it even more more ammunition for the media and fans to criticize and when you do go in public and do do interviews and stuff like that at least it brings some humanity to the situation. At, at what point did you realize this wasn't going to go away? This is going to last longer than a week or two, and then this was going to start to affect your life as as it has. Well. Since. It started tapering down after a week or two weeks. I started getting back out to work. Um, they did have a guard in my office at the bank, not, not guarding the bank, just me um, for, I don't think, a year or something. But they paid him just to be there for me. And that, that was pretty, that was nice. 
Um, the people stopped coming to our house. We did have a package arrive that we didn't know about. And they, the bomb squad came out. It turned out to be cheese curds. So, which is kind of funny. Um, but I started at that time getting asked to speak. Uh, one of the San Luis Obispo Chamber of Commerce had this, this meeting every Thursday uh, once a month. And the, uh, uh, the person in charge asked me, hey, can you come and talk about your your situation and how you overcame it. And that's where I started my public speaking. I came up with, uh, I'll just give you the Reader Digest version. There's noise in your life, which Seattle is the noisiest stadium in the NFL. So there's all this noise coming at you. It could be your wife. It could be, you know, people hating me and, and officiating. It could be your family. You know, um, there's myriads of things coming outside. Then you have your internal noise, self-talk, all that stuff. Well, I, I came up with this thing. I said, when the noise in your life gets overwhelming, you can be deaf to the noise. And the, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. The D stands for decide to stand, don't be a victim. So don't play the victim card. Stand, you made a decision, stand there, take it, you know, deal with it. If it's wrong, you'll learn from it. If it's right, great. Um, then the E is embrace stress and pressure, pressure. It helps you grow. So when you make that decision, you can get pressure coming on you. And um, it really fine tunes you. you. You look at like how did diamonds made out of coal from pressure. Uh, you know, you trim rose bushes back so they grow back, you know, nicer. So that same thing with us humans that we, uh, we can learn from that. And if you're spiritual, you know, there's a spiritual application. There's also, it, it doesn't matter. Successful people I've seen all my life, they don't really freak out. They, they grow. And then the last, or no, the A is adopting attitude. You can control your attitude because your attitude can get affected. I say set it like a thermostat. So you have, you've got an attitude, things are coming at you. You don't go up and down. You don't, you don't panic. And then the F is form a foundation. In the form of foundation, if you go through those steps, you're going to form a foundation that when the next time that noise comes at you, you're going to say, oh, been there, done that. My foundation is strong against that noise. However, noise never goes away. And there's always new noise in your life. So typically, that's, well, actually, that's what I do in public speaking. I go through it in a lot more depth whether it's a business like Boeing, uh, a sports team, a NCAA sports team, uh, small groups, mega churches, I've done it all. When you wrote your book, Making the Call, was that cathartic for you? Cathartic? Um, actually, I had a best-selling author that was supposed to do it, and we got in a time crunch, and he started having me write a bunch of it. So I ended up writing half of it. I wasn't you know, I'm, I'm no author. I did go to UCLA and study history. I know how to write essays, but it's basically each chapter is a mini essay. So I wrote half of the book and uh, was it cathartic? Well, I get to lay out everything. Um, I get to, got to lay out how I got through it with the, what I just gave you, the acronym DEF. And uh, so, and my faith, uh, you know, I, I met Tony Dungy through all this, who's a great man of faith. Uh, and has been through challenges himself. Um, so he endorsed it and, and shared on, on the front cover. Uh, so yeah, the catharth catharsis, you would say, is, is what, I don't know. I, I just wasn't really upset about everything. I just rolled with it. As you, as you look back 10 years later, are you... Are you happy you took the opportunity to be a referee or you wish maybe that this, this didn't happen? Oh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, what a great experience. It doesn't matter how it worked out. Uh, it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, I can't, it, like a dream. I got to work in Lambeau Field again. It's like, that's the mecca of football. Uh, and great crowd, great stadium. Some of the stadiums and crowds, whoo. They were rough. I wouldn't even take my kid to a game, you know, with all the language I heard. Um, but go ahead. 
Well, Lance, you've been, you've, it's, it's, you've been to hell and back. Uh, 10 years later, you, you have a great attitude towards things. Uh, you, you dealt with the criticism and, and the, the calls and uh, the media scrutiny, and, and you came out looking good. You're Andy Dufresne. You came <laughs> out on top. You're the Andy <laughs> Dufresne of referees. So congratulations, Lance. And I, I guess congratulations on your, on your 10-year anniversary of the failed Mary. Yeah, yeah. Actually, too, I didn't tell you. I have a company, they're trying to do a documentary. I filmed it for five hours with them. And you talk about cathartic. That's where I, they brought me back to almost my childhood. And, you know, before, during, and after the call, uh, it, it's what's happened to me over the years. Um, so so that's that might be out. And then they're talking about making a feature film. All right. Well, we look forward to watching this and uh, I've known you for about uh, 10, a little, I guess, eight years now. So uh, yeah, something uh, like that. So I appreciate you giving me a few minutes here and uh, we'll we'll celebrate the 10th anniversary uh, coming up. So congratulations, Lance. And thank you so much, Lance. Thank you, Mike. Talk to you. Talk to you soon. Thank you.